Welcome to COIQ, a first of its kind video program about health innovators, early adopters, and influencers, and their stories about riding the roller coaster of healthcare innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy, founder of Legacy DNA Marketing Group, and it's time to raise our COIQ. Welcome back to the show, COIQ listeners. On today's episode, I have Roger Jansen with us. He is the CEO for Health Eco. He's also the Chief Strategy Officer for Spectrum Health. Welcome to the show, Roger. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I just left my role as Chief Strategy Officer at Spectrum Health to completely focus on Health Eco. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's a great entree into tell us a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure. So I, uh, my formal training is my PhD is in clinical and neuropsych and did the typical psychologist route, saw patients for a while and that type of thing. And I've always had a passion for innovation and for business and how do you actually take great ideas and understand how do you not only create the great idea, but execute on it and then how do you actually scale and bring that idea to the market in a robust manner? So uh, for the past nine years, I've been in the administrative side in the C-suite of a health system. Mm-hmm. Uh, been the chief strategy officer as well as the president of uh, our innovation or our uh, ventures group and the chief ch- chairman of our innovations division. And in that role, I've had the opportunity to kind of see great ideas both succeed as well as fall short. And sometimes the ones that you thought would be absolutely successful are the ones that turn out to be, for some reason, not the ones adopted and yeah. vice versa. And uh, I think we're always learning about why some innovation and great ideas work and others aren't as great as we thought they were out of the gate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what what are you doing in your role as the CEO for uh, Health Eco? Yeah, so our focus right now is actually to work with uh, what we call the health ecosystem because we don't believe that a lot of the innovations that happen both inside of health systems as well as at employers or even with early stage or growth stage companies, that there seems to be this barrier between the great idea and the actual execution, adoption, and implementation of that idea. And as a result, sometimes we have amazing solutions that for one reason or another don't get uh, adopted. And as a result, the life cycle of that company gets shortened and they disappear. And as we see that, we're actually missing great opportunities to help patients to do a better job of delivering care and to bring solutions in the marketplace that really should have their voice. And so what we're trying to do is actually work with all major constituents in health, uh, from venture capitalists to health systems, to payers, to employers, so on and so forth, and actually create a common platform from which we can work to solve these common problems. Uh, Instead of having this very chunkiness and these one-off quote unquote, sound bites that creates a very noisy and, con- and confusing ecosystem. Yeah. How do we actually bring a rhythm and a pattern to that ecosystem so we can get to the best solutions and adoption of those solutions more readily? So that's one area. There's certainly other things that we do, but that, that's an area I think relevant to your, to your audience. Okay, excellent. So how would you describe um, the roller coaster of healthcare innovation today? Um, I, you know, I think it's very different inside of a system, outside of the system, entrepreneur versus large company. Yep. I think from inside health systems, uh, what I tend to see is that innovation departments are typically just IP departments where maybe a physician or someone else has an interesting idea and it's brought to the group and they don't know how to monetize it, how to commercialize it, even how to do market analysis of how readily the idea would be adopted or not. <clears throat> and so innovation is really kind of a misnomer uh, in in that respect. And I I think health systems in general, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, are very focused on what's immediately in front of them in their next meeting. And so the whole idea of R&D within health systems seems to be lost. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know health systems who are 15, $20 billion in revenue. And when you ask them, what is your R&D budget? They don't even know how to think about that or they don't even have one. Uh, so I would say innovation within health systems is very difficult. Yeah. And I think it takes a, a different personality and entrepreneurial mindset to be successful there. I think within larger corporations where, you know, they're competing in more of a free market where they have to compete uh, against others who have equally talented engineers and staff and others can think differently and are forced to because their economics are based upon that. Yeah. Health systems economics, if you're sick or injured, you're, you're going to the doctor. Uh, you're going to the hospital in your community. And the less competition we have for that and the more that one system owns tertiary, quaternary, specialty care, 
um, you know, the less innovative we have to be around everything from payment models to deployment and of resources. So I think we have a long way to go uh, to become mm -hmm. innovative inside health systems is what we have been maybe outside health systems. And I think one of the biggest gaps is the successful entrepreneur or someone who should be a successful entrepreneur can't get the right audience uh, within health systems or with the payers and others. And there's always this prove it to me first and then you know we'll work with you later. Um, and that creates a real gap and it's difficult to really allow innovation at scale to unfold when they have those real barriers in front of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, last time you and I talked, we were talking about this statistic that I came across, which really is kind of the foundational for all the work that we do and, and really a catalyst for this show, that 95% of innovations that are brought to market fail to reach any adequate level of customer acceptance um, or profitability. So I want to get your perspective. Why do you think some innovations fail and some succeed? Um, I think it's, you know, it's a multivariate response, right? I think on one level is, is what is true innovation versus what is, you know, something brand new um, versus enhancing something that's already in place. Um, but I think what's the irony of it is I think most people adopt solutions that make what they're already doing easier for them to do. Uh, whether that's Uber to get a cab ride or it's, you know, hotels.com to get a last minute hotel room. Uh, it's finding a solution that makes what I always, the problem I already have in front of me easier for me. So getting people to ultimately change their behavior and, you know, say, I want to do this differently is difficult. And you're talking about a behavioral change process that I just don't think many of us appreciate. Uh, I'll give you one example. Okay. We invested in a company that um, did some really interesting things with measurement of bodily fluids and, uh, it, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it does some wonderful things, but unfortunately getting physicians to adopt how they would use that technology to measure blood loss and other uh, uh, issues is really difficult because they have been doing it by sponge counting for a long, long time. And even when we can show uh, an ROI and improvement and even safety improvements, sometimes adoption of technology is just isn't as strong as we would think because it just makes so much logical sense. So I think the biggest barrier we often face isn't one of, is it a better product or solution? It's the emotional side of change and the emotional side of believing that it's going to be better when, than what I'm already doing because I'm already pretty good at what I do already. So I think we have a number of issues that we go through that are less about product and more about humans thinking and processing and emotional side than it is about, is there really something better out there? Yeah. Um, because there's just incredibly smart people putting incredible solutions that just don't get adopted. And you sit and go, how did that not work? Right, right. Yeah. So do you think it is the same for healthcare? You know, in, in the context that you just described, do you think it's the same for health, the same complexity for healthcare as it is for these other industries? And, and you know, you kind of think of just how other industries are being disrupted all often that yeah. still are kind of requiring some behavior change, which I absolutely agree with you. Um, is, is there some other um, drivers in the healthcare industry just inherent that make it even more complex than if you were in other markets? I think so. Um, you know, the way healthcare is paid for is, is, you know, very different than any other product and free market principles don't necessarily apply to healthcare. So, um, I think sometimes we think that healthcare is this bastion of, um, you know, it operates like every other industry. And I can tell you because of regulations, because of how payment is made, because of way people get to make decisions, because there's an esoteric level to the knowledge that's present, it isn't like buying a refrigerator. Um, and because the consumer pays only a very small portion of the services that they receive in a typical basis, what we also see is people don't shop or operate like they do with other consumer products. So I do think there's something unique about bringing these solutions to healthcare, but mm -hmm. uh, I believe the disruption probably comes from the outside, not from within the inside. Uh, I just don't see an incredible amount of motivation for health systems to change. Uh, yeah. You know, it, as much as we look at them uh, and say they're doing the latest and greatest, if we had a time machine and we can go back to 1980, it really, besides maybe some decorations on the wall, wouldn't feel too different than it does. Today. <laughs> sad, 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 but true. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, 
unlike other industries, you know, we're talking about lives that are at stake, right? And are not just those people over there, but our families and, and maybe even ourselves one day. Um, so there's definitely a lot more at stake. I had, um, I had a physician entrepreneur on the show not too long ago, and he was innovating outside of the health system. Mm -hmm. But it was something that absolutely um, solved a problem that the health system that he was affiliated with experienced. And they were completely opposed to it. He had to go external to the market, launch it successfully, share it with some of their competitors. And then all of a sudden, they were ready to adopt. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's probably more true than not true, unfortunately. I've heard that story from different physicians actually had a call with just a physician not too long ago, uh, just this morning. And, you know, they're feeling like they can't be a profit in their own land and they can't get their solutions adopted. And I, I, Roxy, I really think what's going to continue to happen is you're going to see once you create a culture where you don't support new approaches and you don't approach failing as it isn't, we failed. We just tried another way that maybe wasn't as successful as we thought until we get to the next level. Yeah. Um, you really impede and you only attract a certain type of employee to that environment. <clears throat> and so I've always said your best employees are volunteers and they're going to walk at some point if they can't do what they want. It very much reminds me of a friend of mine who's a, uh, an elite chef who was forced to work at a university and he could not express his true chef talents cooking for dormitories. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he eventually ended up leaving and creating, you know, a, what I would say was a very successful restaurant and continues to operate three of them today uh, because he felt his talents were being locked up and limited. And I think if you get people who are really good at maintenance and operations, but they think that running a health system is just making what we do today better than what it was yesterday and more efficient than it was yesterday versus how do we transform what we do? I think what you're going to get is what we have in the United States right now, an incredibly complex, incredibly cumbersome, and incredibly expensive health system uh, that's actually not a system because a system would imply that there's a process that connects things together to get an outcome. What it is is every hospital for themselves. And uh, we don't really have a healthcare system in the United States. Uh, We have a payment system uh, through the government, but systems themselves are not really in play. Sure. So, so I think that, you know, you have a very unique point of view for our listeners, right? Because a, a good portion of our audience are, is, is really trying to sell yeah. to organizations in the role that maybe you had previously, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, what, what are some strategies that you recommend yeah. Um, and how do they, how do they, how do they get in, in front of the right people? Um, yeah. I, I have a whole bunch of other questions, but I'll just I'll yeah. one at a time. <laughs> I'll say it's tough. It's really difficult because um, the way that most health systems operate is you're given a budget and you operate according to that budget, and that budget rarely says, you know, I have money in here for company X to approach me and start a new product or a new service. I think those who have the biggest struggle are are the ones who are going to require a lot of behavioral change from somebody to do something differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, Someone who automates something like a salesforce.com that makes managing, you know, connections and customer management more easily or something you already have to do. So now it just becomes a features play and a price play. But if you're coming with something that one, we don't currently do and two, it's going to cost me more money to do it. And three, I don't even know if I need to do it anyway. Um, you've got a really difficult road. So I think my approach is always, uh, when I was, you know, I always have vendors still to this day, you know, call me in a, in a regular basis. And I always try to listen because I, I figure that I really don't know everything and I need to be open to different approaches. So I think finding the right C-suite individual is the right way to go. And I do recommend the C-suite as much as you can, because I think everybody else is, in health systems that uh, particularly is are looking at what is their spend and is it going to be commensurate with what they think it should be relative to the outcomes they're getting. Yeah. Um, the other piece that I've always found helpful is frame up the problem uh, as clearly as you can. Don't sell me on the features. Uh, everybody seems to get really feature focused, like my app or my solution could do this, 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 and this. And I still walk away going, but that doesn't solve my problem. And it's really cool technology you built 
but I wasn't on the streets looking for cool technology. I'm trying to figure out how does your product solve the issues that I have. And I haven't heard a lot of people really sell me as effectively on how it's going to make my life easier and better. It's always about how cool would this be if you did this? Oh my goodness. And that is, I mean, that's like just business 101, right? Marketing 101. I mean, it's so foundational and and we all know it. I mean, those people that are pitching you, they know it. It's just, it's a real hard, difficult habit to break. (laughs) It is. I think what, you know, we buy so many consumer products. It's how many megabytes does my computer have? How fast does my car go? You know, how many drawers does my refrigerator have for that matter? And we get so feature focused, but it's not consumer product selling that most are doing. And so I think we get a little caught in that. And that that's always been something where as soon as somebody starts talking about the features, it's not as interesting as somebody's talking about the outcomes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you kind of remind me of, you know, an, another thing around like storytelling, which I think you're kind of also touching on is, you know, just because you have a technology that's superior to what's on the market, um, or um, even if it solves a real problem, it doesn't mean that you're going to automatically be successful. The, right. you know, I, I really think that storytelling ends up being really important too. And it's interesting to hear that you said that, you know, most people aren't really telling the right story or a good story. Yeah, no, I'm not. I, and, and, and also I don't know if they think about adoption of their solution uh, because it takes so much scale to make it a real business and it takes so much internal adoption to actually make it a real solution for any health system. So, you know, if you have, let's say, a thousand physicians at your hospital and your product is solving, you know, that solution for seven of those physicians, that may or may not be enough. And that may or may not be something that's, you know, worth your time and energy. So I think I haven't, you know, I think some of the best vendors that I've I've dealt with um, make me feel like they've become a partner and are helping me be more successful in what I'm doing versus I'm helping them get their product into into a company. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So what would you say is the biggest challenge um, in commercializing and innovation? Uh, you know, so we're, we're touching on some of that, but is it problem solution fit, problem market fit? Is it storytelling? Is it the misalignment of the payment initiatives? Is it something else or all of the above? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's it's certainly, you know, to every question, there's a simple answer and it's wrong, right? So I think there's a lot of complexity to that question. I think one of the things I see is that, um, and this is not something that's fun, but I think sometimes the solution is ahead of the market. And so, you know, even if you have the best X, Y, and Z solution, the market might not be ready to pay for it or it might not understand it. And so, you know, making a market is really, really difficult and commercializing whether, and if you're trying to commercialize an asset from your health system out into the broader market, I think it becomes an issue of competence because I don't think many health systems have that competence, even if they have a great product, whether it's an insurance product or it's a primary care product or what it might be, they don't really understand how to build a business. Their business yeah. is built from hundred years of being in that facility. Pa- grandparents were born there. I was born there. Everybody's born there. <laughs> right. and they have built in business and because nobody else can fix the broken bone, I'm going to come there. Right. So, you yeah. know, I think sometimes we act like these businesses of healthcare are the same as traditional, you know, Ford competing against, against GM, and it's just not. It, it isn't. We have to recognize that. So once you begin to recognize that, then you have to think about what can I do to help them either diversify their revenue streams, repatriate margin because they can spend less with my service or not, or create some type of unique niche within a market that allows them to be successful and generate a new business from the one that they currently don't have or they can have. Mm-hmm. But I think one-off solutions are really tough. And I think um, things that are very episodic in what healthcare is eternal are also very, very difficult. So, um, you know, I don't have an easy answer for how do yeah. people do that because I don't think it's an, there is an easy answer. So, so you know, I, I want to ask you this question. Um, it, I, I live in dreamland and then I also live in reality, right? So both, both worlds. Um, but thinking of dreamland, if there was two or three things that you could change that would make innovation in healthcare easier, what would be, th- what would you change? Um, inside a health system from, from that perspective? It could be either inside or outside, either inside um, to innovate within 
and to go out or to be more ripe for adoption for everything that's coming into the system? Well, I think you need to start with our health systems really not for profit. Um, and is that the right model still? And in some cases, it may be, in other cases, it may not. But rarely does anyone around the globe say, if we really want to be innovative, we're going to go look at not-for-profits um, because it hasn't forced that economic model and it hasn't forced that type of thinking. Yeah. So it, it's difficult to win a basketball game when you're playing with tennis players. Um, you need to get people who understand if I want to innovate and not just maintain and be more bureaucratic – I need to bring entrepreneurial spirit and talent and capabilities to the table that have tended to be frowned upon within, you know, bureaucracies and governments and things of that nature. Causing trouble over there, right? <laughs> Causing trouble over there. You think differently. That's not how we do things around here. Um, you know, as Steve Jobs says, the crazy ones that will change the world except in healthcare. Yep, so, yep. <laughs> so uh, you know, I think you, you've got to get some, you've got to get some different thinking in your business to begin with. I think the other thing that uh, people need to do from a dreamland perspective is they need to set aside a portion of their budget for these types of activities. Mm -hmm. um, and it can't be, we're going to give it there because it's cute and fancy. You need to do it because it's, it's what's going to drive transformation. It's going to drive the future. Um, but that really requires a third thing that I think most people fail to think about, which is not innovation in its purest sense, but innovation of a business model. Mm, and mm -hmm. we haven't seen a lot of systems spend time innovating their business model. But I think where, you know, great companies go is they innovate their business model. And if you take a look at what Apple has done, is Apple a technology company? Are they um, a company that warehouses information? Are they a company of digital therapeutics? They continue to innovate their business model just as Amazon and others have done. You know, Google has nine businesses that have a billion users a day. And then they have a other hundred businesses that make no money. And right. those other businesses are all about how do they create what's the next billion dollar uh, or billion user business or sure. feed that information to the others. Um, find a healthcare system who's willing to take a loss on R and D and you know, I'm, I'm willing to buy a great steak dinner. Right, right, uh, right, right. It, right it, exactly. It's not the mindset and it needs to be. And I think if, if profit in executives and healthcare can continue to be paid upon their margins, you're going to see them operating in a way that just drives margin. And margin is maybe the wrong thing for a not-for-profit to be measuring itself on. Sure. Uh, so we've got a whole bunch of conundrums within healthcare that need to really get addressed. Um, I think if you were to start with standardized pricing across the country, just like they have in Japan, where an MRI is $134 no matter where you go, you get pretty innovative about how you attract that talent and how you attract those consumers to your market. <laughs> Versus our current model, which nobody really cares and nobody has to compete on price. Right, right. Yeah, completely. So you touched on something earlier um, that I want to, I don't want to overlook about prove it first, right? So when health innovators are, um, you know, trying to get into systems um, that they've got to prove it first. So we've had some conversations uh, previously around, um, you know, pilot clinical studies, peer reviewed studies, you know, do I have to have just a couple of pilots? Do I have to have some peer reviewed studies? Right. How much proof do I need to have before I have enough credibility to be able to sure. get some adoption? Um, you know, what's your, what's your take on that? You know, I think it depends on the, the type of product and solution. I mean, like if you take a look at behavioral health, which I'm passionate about, um, you know, round numbers, there's 10,000 apps a year that are put into the app store uh, around behavioral health or chronic disease. Um, exactly 0.00025% of them have done any research. Uh, so people throw out scientific jargon and they, they have great bells and whistles, but we're actually potentially damaging our patient populations by putting apps into a marketplace that are extremely noisy and confusing. And once they try them, they say, geez, I tried this and I still didn't get better. We've actually increased uh, their risk and their symptomatology versus sure. simply, you know, uh, saying it wasn't good technology to begin with. So I think what you need is you need to have some credible people who are willing to evaluate your product. And for me, that typically means who is your board of directors or board of advisors? Um, have they looked at this and said, this is something I'm willing to put my name and my brand behind? And are there people who the rest of the industry would say they respect? Because, you know, having a PhD and having done a lot of research, you know, research is great. 
Um, but research is limited and research takes time and research takes money. And it's somewhat the antithesis of what entrepreneurs have. They don't have a lot of time and have a lot of money. Right. So you need to be able to balance those things with enough credibility that you're not becoming, you know, Johns Hopkins research de- department, but you're becoming credible because the thought, the discipline, the rigor, and that you are willing once the solution is adopted to continue to put it through the research that a health system and others might need to ensure its use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, if, if, if a health innovator was standing before you, what's, you know, what's some of the requirements that you would have to, to, to con- seriously consider what they had to offer? Um, one is, and this is going to sound really, really basic, but um, is it even worth my, a, a big enough population that it's going to make a big enough difference? Uh, so, for example, you know, I've heard people bring ideas to me that are so esoteric and for such a small group of people that with the relative time I have to spend on the other things, yeah. it's going to have a big enough impact. Um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, can it make an impact for a large enough group of people Two, is it going to somehow, um, do one of three things, improve my outcomes, lower my cost or create new markets and revenue that I currently don't have. And then probably the other thing that's really relevant, and I haven't seen a lot of entrepreneurs bring this to me, but is, uh, how much are you willing to work with me? And, you know, how flexible can you be working with me? versus here's the way it's going to look and here's the way it's going to operate. And this is my, my pricing model and everything else. So I think there needs to be a partnership and uh, you know, I think bringing systems together to do things together Mm -hmm. is better than just selling me alone. So I've always found it helpful that it saved myself and three other chief strategy officers or whoever it might be would have gotten together and said, let's try this. Um, There's power and strength in numbers. So I would recommend to entrepreneurs hold a meeting, bring the right people who you think you're going to sell to together and have them spend two hours with you, you know, in a Chicago or a location that's convenient Mm -hmm. and talk through your solution. And if it works, you know, pay them for their time, give them an equity position in this, whatever it might be, but you need to make it more than just a vendor relationship out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Um, That's a really good point you know, some of the health innovators that I work with think that they have to have everything figured out and all of the answers in order to be credible and in order to really get in front of, you know, folks like yourself. And, and I, and I think that sometimes it's okay for some of those things to be somewhat gray and ambiguous. Um, you got to have some substance there. Um, but seeing it as a partnership and having some flexibility, um, could, could be a very viable approach. Yeah. I, I actually, I've never met a company or a human being or anything that has it all figured out. Um, you know, Funny this enough, me either. <laughs> right, yeah. so this isn't math where, you know, two and two equals four. Although I have a friend who's a theoretical mathematician and tells me that's actually not accurate. <laughs> uh, I don't know how it's not accurate. It's well above me, but <laughs> right, right. It's not accurate all the time. And, uh, I'm sure he's right. I don't understand it. Right. But, yep. I, I would tell you, uh, you know, that ability to rec- recognize that you don't have all the answers and that you're part of a solution is probably more um, resonates with me more than anything else. But that also gives opportunity for me to have influence on your company and uh, say, here's how we might want to improve it, which sure. makes me more bought in and therefore more likely to say, I like this. Yeah, yeah, completely. So who's doing it well? Um, you know, what are some innovators out there, whether they're, you know, those big bureaucratic systems who have figured out a way to innovate, um, or whether it's some innovators out there that um, either luck or, um, or, or experience and expertise that are yeah. just doing it really well that our listeners and our audience should pay attention to. Yeah, you know what's sad about that? It's like when people ask me who's a great president over the last hundred years, I struggle to jump to any answer. Um, <laughs> and I don't mean that as a negative. It's just like when I think about, you know, maybe we've idealized the uh, Jeffersons or the Washingtons or the Lincoln <clears throat> much, but um, you know so many flaws about so many people today that it's hard to come up with someone. Sure. Um, you know, I've gotten to know so many innovators, health system innovators throughout the country. Um, I think a lot of uh, my you know, former peers are doing some really great things. 
to say that everybody, anyone has it completely figured out, and this is the model that absolutely works, I think would be probably yeah. the vote. I do think some of the things that I've been exposed to at the Amazons and the Googles of the world are probably more jaw dropping than people who haven't seen them are going to recognize. And they're doing things with a very different mindset where I think their approach is we're going to deliver health that doesn't feel like care. And I think that's a very different mindset. And it's um, one that until we change our mindset of what it means to be a hospital or what it means to be a doctor, we're going to continue to deliver care based upon that mental model that we operate with. And innovation is going to be limited based upon what we think the boundaries of that mental model are. So, you know, I would say that I've seen some great things coming out of some systems around the country. You know, I think uh, Providence is doing some really interesting things. Um, I've seen some great stuff. I really like what Steve Clasco is advocating for down at Jefferson. And I think mm-hmm. he's, he's, a, he's a, he's a big voice for change in the industry, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think Rhonda Krishnan, who is the CEO of Rush uh, in Chicago, is really pushing the envelope and saying we need to think differently about healthcare as well as how we train doctors. Uh, Norm Beauchamp, who is the Dean of the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State, is taking a very different approach to how he thinks about educating the next group of clinicians. And I That's think it's great. those people who are very open who will change the mindset of our clinicians to say, I don't need to think mm-hmm. about being a doctor like, you know, uh, they did with uh, the 1970s TV shows. Um, <laughs> think about what it means to be an entrepreneur and a doctor and a business person and someone who is a scientist all at the same time and do something differently. Yeah. So I would say, you know, the, the people who are the best irrespective of locales are the people I think who are changing the rigidity from which they look at the world and mm-hmm. are willing to be possible. It's exciting. It's yeah. exciting to hear about more people like that that are out there because we yeah. are so desperate for change. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a pretty broken system right now. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so for the, for our audience that's listening, um, the last question that I have for you is what advice do you have for them? Uh, for the entrepreneurs, I would say just, um, is, is, it's kind of, uh, silly to say it, but, uh, believe in what you have more than the feedback you receive. Uh, I think it's very easy for people who are in positions of these large corporations to make you feel that you're not as talented or as competent as what they are because of the position they're in. But having sat in both positions, I believe it's actually 20 X harder to start something than it is to maintain something that's already operating. And so, you know, take, take some comfort in recognizing that while you don't have the, all the answers and you may not have the expense account to do exactly what you want, it's the energy uh, of the entrepreneur that actually drives the innovation for the entire country. And truly what made uh, this country, you know, the economic leader that it is, it's, it's not the corporation. Even the big companies are, whether you're talking about some of the large companies that we've mentioned, a lot of their innovation doesn't come internally. It comes from saying, we're going to go buy someone who already is innovative. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, I would say keep fighting to the last breath, so to speak. Um, and I think the best way for them to get some credibility is to find someone who believes in them. So find that one versus trying to find a lot. And if mm-hmm. you get the one, let them be your spokesperson. Yeah, that's great advice. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our audience today. I really appreciate it. For yeah. those that want to connect with you in the future, how yeah. do they get a hold of you? Sure. You can email me at uh, Roger, that's R-O-G-E-R dot Jansen, J-A-N-S-E-N at thehealtheco.com. So the word the, and then health, and eco.com. Excellent. Thanks, Roger. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate you. What's the difference between launching and commercializing a healthcare innovation? Many people will launch a new product. Few will commercialize it. To learn the difference between launch and commercialization and to watch past episodes of the show, head to our video show page at drroxy.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show. You can subscribe to the latest episodes on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or subscribe to the video episodes on our YouTube channel. No matter the platform, just search COIQ with Dr. Roxy. Until next time, let's raise our COIQ.